Well, I told you there's a lot of implications from icons. Uh, in the last video, we talked about the basic background, some of the initial introductory thoughts or rationale for icons. But today, uh, I want to get back into sort of the implications and ramifications. First, uh, when we look at icons in that sort of um, classical sense, where they take on this theological role and purpose, we're tempted to really question is, is this kind of icon good for us? And when I say we, I come from a Protestant and Baptist tradition. Um, here is a picture of a uh, church that it looks like it might be a Greek Orthodox church or Eastern Orthodox in some sense, uh, but in fact it is a Baptist congregation. Uh, they're from the country of Georgia, and their church looks a lot like other churches in Georgia, like the Orthodox churches, and yes, they use icons. All right, I mean, I'm going to be a bit provocative here, but I raise this because I think there is a lot of um, uncertainty as to how and when we can use images in our churches today. So uh, if I were to show you a few images that we're used to seeing, it might raise this question. Uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist, predominantly white church tradition, and uh, this image of the white Anglo Jesus uh, was, was in almost every Sunday school room. Uh, there's lots of images that we tend to hang around our church, and it brings up questions about what images are appropriate and what are not. I teach at a school that has a chapel filled with icons, with images. And in fact, our building and our school is named after a particular Baptist preacher named George W. Truitt, and his image is found all around our building, and there's even a room called the Heritage Room with relics from him. And so I, I show this just to ask about um, what the role of icons are for us today. And that's where I say, what are their impl implications and ramifications? And I want to get into a few areas. Uh, so let's, let's tackle these one at a time. Okay, so the first, I think, question we've got to tackle is, are icons really necessary? At the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Council of Nicaea, 787, it required all churches to have icons and relics. It required all Christians to affirm icons. Uh, it implied their necessity for the faith. So are they necessary? Well, I, I, as a Protestant, that uh, council doesn't hold authority for me. So the answer is obviously they're not needed in an absolute sense. We're free to do what we want. Um, but what I want to tackle with that question is the nature of the debate at the time and its implications. The argument that you should destroy icons because icons are banned was said to be a heresy, a Christological heresy. Iconoclasm is a denial of the incarnation because you're denying that God has become visible, manifested, tangible. So iconophilia or iconodualism, the orthodox answer, was to insist on icons to, um, to display God's incarnation visibility, tangibility, which has huge implications for the faith. Because if we were to think about God as now being um, sensible, available to our sight and touch and hearing, uh, the materiality of God himself, God who is willing to take on the dust of this earth, the flesh like our bodies, is an affirmation of, uh, of creation, of matter, of our bodies, it, is, uh, it makes it a matter of faith that we're not docetic. We're not like the Gnostics allegedly were, where we are only concerned about things spiritual or things of the soul or the mind and not the body. Our whole faith should be one that's concerned with tangibility, the human touch from one to another, the, in, the uh, sacramental nature, which is a debate we'll need to get into. Um, but the fact that our belief that God is really present in the things we do, even in the art around our church and the ministry and the things that we do in our liturgy and in our worship, um, in some sense or another, our faith must be iconic. We'll get into more of what that means now. Okay, now another question we really get into is the relationship of not just icons of Jesus, but what about icons of other saints? And the reason that they're affirmed is because sainthood is affirmed. And that doesn't, uh, in the ancient church, mean people who have made it to a certain level of sainthood. 
but any of the heroes of the faith who've gone on and are already in the full presence of, of God in the next life. Um, so here's sort of how the logic of first the communion of the saints itself works, and then we'll back to icons. Um, communion of the saints, officially taught, never placed intermediaries between Christ and us because of the biblical statement that Christ is the only um, intermediary between God and man or God and humanity. So if he's the only mediator between the two, then these other saints aren't really in between us and God, but there's a communion of saints. So the way this works is if I have been baptized into Christ and you have been baptized into Christ, then we are in communion, communion with one another. Uh, not through any other medium, only through our individual communion with Christ. We then have mutual communion through Christ with one another. And it matters not if I'm on one side of the room and you're on the other side of the world, we can still be in communion with each other. And then it matters not if I am alive and you are dead, we are still in communion because we are all alive in Christ. So Christ is the hub, the center uh, that unites us, places a, us in communion. Now I mentioned I come from a Protestant tradition where we Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox disagree. So far, we agree on all of this. Where we disagree is uh, the Protestant tradition isn't convinced that we can, in addition to be in communion with the saints, also be in communication with the saints. So we really distrust that idea. So how do we know the saints are listening? Don't they have better things to do? But if you believe that we are in Christ and we can be in communication with him through prayer, which is just talking to God, talking to Christ, can't we also be in communion and communication with the saints? And if so, if either of those two are right, well then certainly it's okay to depict the saints in glory with a halo, with a Shekinah glory of God, as it were, radiating off of Moses' face. So depiction of saints is um, is is technically, theologically, orthodox. Now, that also brings up the question of the idea of worship of saints. A lot of Protestants accuse Catholics and the Orthodox of worshiping them, worshiping Mary and others, officially, all the teaching throughout the ancient church, the Middle Ages, up into today in the Catholic Church, is uh, Mary nor the saints are ever worshiped. Instead, they are venerated. So the difference between worship, uh, proscune, bending the knee, the Greek word is, that's reserved for God. But we can honor those who've gone before us. We honor our ministers. We honor our grandparents, our parents. We honor the ancestors in the faith as well. So if we can honor them, then uh, we are in communion with them. We can depict them honorifically. Uh, and then that also brings up the role of Mary in particular. Uh, Mary is seen as the highest of the saints, highest ranking, because after all, she bore God in her womb. She gave birth to God the Son, Jesus Christ. So she, in a sense, represents the full culmination of all of creation and, and Israel's history up to that point, and she foreshadows what the church and all history to come should be after that. There's a full theology around Mary, and I'm afraid we just can't get into all of the specifics about her own perpetual virginity, later, much later uh, declarations about the Immaculate Conception. Maybe that can be another video sometime. But you see, the idea of icons with Jesus, if Jesus is tangible, visible, he can be depicted. And Jesus wants, uh, affirms this tangibility, visibility, uh, this kind of communal, sacramental faith, so we can depict others as well. And the question is, what role do they play? Okay, final sort of implication about this with saints then would be about relics. We've talked about relics in class before, but remember, we believe in Christian tradition that even things attached to people, uh, if someone really participated in God's glory and the grace of God, then their things like that, that robes and things that were attached to them can also somehow participate in this. And why is that? It's because we're not Gnostics. We believe that it's not just our mind and our spirit that 
participates in God, even our bones. And the real biblical basis for the bones of the saints being relics, having, having spiritual power, even power to heal, comes from 2 Kings 13. I encourage you to go read the story. Elisha's bones, he was long dead, and they laid another dead man on top of him, and through circumstance, suddenly he touched the bones, and suddenly those bones still had the healing power of God in them to make the man come back to life. So, could we depict Elisha in an icon? Could we assume relics of Elisha have power? Uh, do we believe that we are in communion with these saints and God wants to work tangibly through the body of Christ? Uh, according to Christian tradition, the answer is always yes. Well, I think the final thoughts I'd want to leave you with on this is, is to admit we've just scratched the surface, um, but hopefully we at least um, recognize the what I would want to say is sort of the iconic, inevitably iconic nature of our faith. Our faith is based on a God who became visible. And our faith is based on depicting this to others. Uh, Augustine talked about how our words, um, he, he said that they are verbal images. And then you have John of Damascus who can talk about uh, visible words. I mean, our scripture itself is meant to, uh, through words, depict what God has done for us. And as we tell others, in a sense, we, the body of Christ, become another icon of Christ. The old cliche that sometimes we're the only Jesus people will ever see. And uh, I think if you start to think th through this more and more, what does this mean for the sacraments? What does this mean for how we understand ministry to work? Um, creeds themselves in the ancient church were first called symbols because they were thought to be symbols uh, very short, brief depictions, uh, ca encapsulations of what the scriptures taught. So I think just about everywhere you look in our faith, you're going to see sort of icons of icons and the, the nature of our faith being one that is visible, tangible, incarnational, and yes, sacramental, and all that goes with that. And the question is for us then, how are we going to uh, be faithful to that aspect of our faith and faithful to uh, Jesus himself as the role, uh, the, the role model, the example, uh, the icon of the invisible God. Hopefully this is at least going to help us start to think about some of these big questions. No, I did. I turned it off. <laughs> okay, okay, you got me. Hold on. Uh, hold on.